We're pleased to have classmate John Roberts speak to us tonight, or actually this afternoon for him <clears throat> in Berkeley. And after graduating from Williams, uh, John went directly into a career in, in dance. Um, I think one of the things that happened to a lot of us was Vietnam intervened and all of a sudden that was something that people needed to think about. And John actually it met, I met his wife, Jody, uh, dancing, and that's been a lifelong dance for him. Uh, so he's continuing to dance. But he's what I would say one of our Renaissance uh, Williams people in terms of doing that. He's been involved in the theater. He's written poetry and has really um, been a stevedore when he was in uh, the uh, reserves. Um, he went to Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, really did his his work there in landscape architecture, uh, excuse me, at, at Berkeley, and uh, uh, as a landscape architect. And then he stayed in Berkeley for the rest of his career. Um, and at that point, uh, when he finished his degree, uh, he went on into the field of landscape architecture, but working in public spaces. And one of the things that's, that's a really interesting is to see all the different things that as I, I got to talk to John and also to read some of his bio. Um, he's been involved very much in, in community spaces. Uh, and that's been in Berkeley. What he did in Berkeley was help to redesign the art district. Uh, he did a Berkeley poetry walk with the US uh, poet laureate, Robert Haas. And he's even a poet uh, in the collection for that. And that one really won an award, the National Poetry Landmark Award. Um, and then he went on from there into uh, designing public spaces in communities, uh, which related to uh, the basically the ecology of the place and uh, really got into the area. So he's been a significant influence in Santa Rosa, uh, San Jose, and doing many uh, different types of parks and easement areas. At the same time, he started with the national parks and got very much involved with the national parks. And so he's done projects in Yosemite National Park, Redwood National Park, and state parks, Sequoia, uh, King Canyon National Park, Golden Gate National Recreation Area and at the city on San Francisco. And sometime uh, we get an opportunity to talk to John on it. He did some great work with the city that I happened to see and it really is, is quite something. It's uh, some historical uh, ideas that, that were presented and then into the landscape. Um, tonight, he's gonna be <clears throat> speaking to us on his involvement and rewilding um, Muir uh, Woods National Monument and Muir Beach as a case study <clears throat> for us to see the complexity of restoring the environment, the public spaces to a wilder, natural, sustainable space. Uh, John also has been teaching at UC Berkeley College of Environment um, and is, is uh, a, <clears throat> the uh, Beatrix <clears throat> Farron Distinguished visiting scholar, and he's been doing that since really the 80s. Uh, when I was talking to John in terms of preparation for this, I was awed by one specific thing, how long it takes and how much patience you have to do to bring people, politicians, landowners, entrepreneurs, and agencies together to develop and execute a comprehensive plan for a public space. So, John, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I, I really, I think we're all excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, what a pleasure it is to do this uh, with all you guys. Um, uh, I'm just going to share my screen uh, first off and try and get myself organized and uh, and talk to you about what we're what we're going to be seeing here. Um, Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, let me see if I can get a, there we go. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, 
uh, I did. Uh, I did graduate from Williams and uh, and went to did the theater. I found that the arts were we learned a lot about how to talk about art and how to analyze art. We didn't learn a lot about how to make art at Williams, at least I didn't. And I found that I had more interest in, in the arts making of the art uh, than uh, than anything else. So I found a way through. Turns out dance is really about spatial design. It's moving through space. And, uh, and in this case, I'm dealing with designing space and their outdoor spaces. Uh, so it's been a career full of spatial design um, uh, in the out of doors. Uh, and it's, the career has been based primarily on ecologically based design and community based design. So the combination has been very important to me uh, to, to not just design gardens for uh, uh, for rich people, but but to do to deal with this as our commons and uh, and what we're looking at here is from the top of Mount Tamalpais out towards the there the the entrance to San Francisco Bay. That's that's there. San Francisco is back here. Golden Gate Bridge is way back there. This is all preserved land. This was the original, uh, the beginning of the conservation movement in this country began basically here. Early pioneers of conservation were here. This is Muir Woods, right, right below us. The creek that flows here, Redwood Creek flows through Muir Woods and out through Franks Valley. And then it ends up at Muir Beach at this location. But what we're looking at here is about 100,000 acres plus of land that has been preserved. And it's been, uh, it was all preserved by public spirited individuals and starting with the, the ones who are early members of this conservation movement. So I thought it would be interesting to talk, to focus this discussion today about the evolution of the conservation movement and how the work that I've done is plugged into it in some way. So it's changed over the years, but it's, it's, uh, it's we're off to a good start here. So, um, all of that land that we saw is it started with just as one guy owned a piece of it and then another guy owned another piece of it and it gradually grew. This is just a smattering of the groups that now have an interest in the work that goes on in that, in that place. The National Park Service, Save the Redwoods League, the Community of Muir Beach, the uh, Fish and Wildlife, this used to be, you can see the difference between now and when this first began, this used to be the California Fish and Game it's no longer that, it's fish and wildlife, a totally different attitude about conservation. Uh, but these are all the different groups that are involved in decision-making on these places. So as Huff was saying, uh, uh, it, this is a complicated uh, set of, it's a layered, a layered bit of work that we're involved in. So here's, here's where I live, uh, Berkeley, uh, North Berkeley, the toe of the hills. Uh, across the bay is Muir Woods, Mount Camel Pius right up above it, and Muir Beach is just down at, at the end. So we'll be looking at these two places in particular and that entire, entire watershed. Turns out Muir Beach is, is the closest ocean, wild ocean beach to most of the Bay Area in San Francisco. An aerial view, I have a, a, an old friend who's a pilot. We took a, a tour and, and got these wonderful photos. This is looking at the Muir Beach area. Uh, Muir Woods in the distance here uh, below Mount Camel Pines. It's important to think about these things when you're dealing with ecologically based design and even community based design, that we're not dealing with individual places in isolation, but we're dealing with watersheds. Muir Beach, everything that the water that flows through Muir Beach comes from everything that falls within that white line. So whatever happens up here affects what goes on in Muir Beach. And similarly, it works the other way. Whatever upstream animal is trying to make it up the stream will be affected by what's upstream there. So the, the planning context for this work is, is at a minimum, it's the watershed. It's the water is the key to any ecologically based design. And so we're thinking in terms of watersheds. Uh, this country was not founded on watersheds. Uh, the, the Thomas Jefferson's act to divide the country up into rectangles had nothing to do with watersheds. And in fact, there's been an ongoing debate ever since about the, the combination of, of those two. Uh, but let's go first to Muir Woods. Uh, Muir Woods National Monument, 
is an old growth redwood forest. <clears throat> it's a, uh, uh, it was preserved uh, in the early 1900s. And so we just recently had a centennial on this. The two of the figures that were key to, the, uh, to creating the conservation movement and Muir Woods and this whole area were John Muir who's on the left and, and uh, William Kent on the right. John Muir, you're familiar with probably one of the early founders, he, he was uh, the, the primary reason Yosemite National Park was made into a national park, became the founder of the Sierra Club and ran it as the president for, for decades and um, is a, an iconic figure in the world of environmental preservation, environmental design. But we, what we also owe him, not only is, is environmental heritage, is conservation and preservation heritage, but we also owe his definition of what wilderness is, which I think has been a problem. Uh, he saw wilderness as a place that was not inhabited. It was a place separate from civilization. And uh, he also had a, an attitude about native people that was, it was quite derogatory. And so the, um, there's an elitism that has evolved in the environmental world, largely because of these two men. Uh, and Muir, Muir actually learned more at the end of his life about the way people live on the land. And by the time he, he, he died, he was actually more complimentary of the local Miwok people than he had been early on. But, but there's a separation between human use and environmental uh, protections uh, that, that is part of his legacy. William Kent is a, uh, 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 was a property owner, a developer in the Marin County area, a uh, son of a wealthy family. And uh, he was uh, particularly interested in the Redwood Forest and loved Muir Woods specifically. Uh, Muir Woods was endangered. There was a utility that wanted to uh, harvest the trees build a dam and create a reservoir. And uh, the San Francisco earthquake had just happened. And, he, uh, and they saw this as, a, as an ideal place to get harvest wood, rebuild the San Francisco Bay Area. And Kent was appalled by that. And his colleagues as well were appalled. And so he bought Muir Woods, uh, the, the, the land that was Muir Woods. Um, the utility, in turn, started condemnation proceedings against him. This is in 1905. And he said, you can't do that. I'm going to call my buddy, Teddy Roosevelt, which he did. And he said, uh, I think I could give this land to the federal government. What do you think about that? And Roosevelt said, it sounds like a good idea to me. How are we going to do that? And through the, the Antiquities Act, they figured out that they could actually take the private land and convert it into a national monument. The first time, first time that had been done. As a result, this became the first, uh, a, a first national monument that was given by private property owner. Kent went on, he's a very interesting figure. He became a uh, politician. He was elected to Congress. He ended up writing the, the legislation that established the National Park Service. There were national parks beforehand. But, uh, but that was, uh, 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 but there was no organization to run, the, to run it. And, um, and so he was a really important figure. He and John Muir had very little to do with each other. He named Muir Woods as a branding exercise as part of his development activities around the area. So Muir Woods became in his mind, actually sort of, his, uh, sort of a Disneyland-like destination for recreation. And uh, Kent Woodlands, Kent, Kentfield, the different communities around, he did not want to name it after himself. He named it after John Muir. So John Muir had very little to do with Muir Woods, uh, it turns out. Kent also was the author of the Chinese Exclusion Act. He was an avowed white supremacist. And, and he thought there was nothing, the only thing worse than an Asian was a Negro. And, uh, and worked his butt off to keep the environmental work that he was doing completely exclusive. So we have, in these two guys that started the conservation movement, I think we have the heritage 
of why it's been so difficult to make environmental activism uh, more socially transparent. Um, we're dealing with that now. It's becoming more and more, and it's one of the travesties of, of, this, of this legacy. But let's go on and, and look at what, what has happened to this, in this case. There's the, the movement has changed considerably. This is an image of Muir Woods at, uh, right about the time that, that Kent turned this over to the National Park Service. It's an absolutely gorgeous place. Uh, these trees specifically were threatened by the dam and by logging, um, and then were preserved. There was salmon in the stream that came up from, from um, Muir Beach. There are tens of thousands. There were legend, uh, legendary uh, uh, stories about people coming and just scooping salmon out of the stream in Muir Woods that were spawning. Part of what Kent did was to, he wanted to open this up for people to visit. And so right before he bought the place, the Bohemian Club decided that it might want to buy it. And so they went and, and established their, their little Bohemian Grove uh, campsite there. That didn't work out for them. They moved to, uh, up into Sonoma County, but Kent liked the idea of turning it over to people. And so thousands of people would come and party in this place. And in order to make it comfortable for them, they would flatten out the ground, remove the understory vegetation, planted lawn, planted uh, English ivy and the like. But this was, this was his idea of how the place should be used. The um, Golden Gate Bridge was in the process of being constructed. Cars were important. And this was true throughout the National Park Service. They wanted to attract cars and cars were allowed and encouraged to drive through Muir Woods. And in fact, it got to be so bad, Kent finally uh, agreed that that was not a good idea. He donated additional property just outside the woods for parking. But this was a, uh, this is an attitude about how you manage the property. Once it's preserved, it was, it was really important to preserve it. But once you preserve it, what do you do with it? And Kent was managing it uh, as a, uh, uh, for about 25 years as the uh, uh, sort of an adjunct to his adjacent developments. He died, uh, the depression came on, Civilian Conservation Corps was, was uh, brought in and someone decided that these trees that had survived just fine for 2000 years, just the way they were, were in danger. And so they decided they had to fix the creek. So the CCC came in and, and ripped up the creek, uh, channelized it, Put it in, put in rock revetments. Uh, you can see the map where they did all their work, and essentially destroyed the salmon habitat. This was prime salmon spawning ground, and uh, not only did they remove trees, but they also uh, destroyed the habitat. So this was uh, uh, this is the legacy that we were faced with. By the time of the 1960s, the um, the the decline, the uh, or by the 80s, I would say, the a number of visitors had increased enormously, but the ecological health of the of the forest was in serious decline. There were very few very few wildlife. Fish were gone, birds were gone. There was a sea change in the in the late '60s and early '70s, and the woods and the environment began to be seen as part of a whole system, not just iconic trees. But you can and this tree in particular. That's the single biggest tree in Muir Woods. And you can see the creek down below, and then you can see a, a, a hiker just down at the, lower, at the lower level. These are enormous, enormous icons, but they are part of a larger system. And, and the sea change as the environmental movement began to take hold was treating this as part of a larger system and the trees were just an expression of that system. Oops, wrong one, sorry. The Bohemian Grove where, uh, where the Bohemian Club set its, set its stakes down originally has been uh, access is now controlled. The understory vegetation is being restored. The lawn is gone. The, uh, the English ivy is being taken out and it's got a viable understory, viable uh, ecological system that is being reestablished at this stage. The creek itself, there are remnants of the old, of the old uh, uh, stone revetments are, are eroding away, trees are falling over and they're allowed to stay. Um, uh, check dams have been removed and letting the water run through. So now there, there are pools and riffles 
excellent habitat for frogs and fish and birds. And the northern spotted owl, for instance, is coming back, even though there are lots of people here. They needed a new visitor center. Uh, I was, this is my first project there was to lo locate a visitor center. I we suggested moving it outside of the woods. And then I suggested they remove the parking lot. It was right jammed up against the building, uh, building against the forest. There's the first redwood tree. Um, 40 years later, they're finally doing this. They're finally creating this time. These things do take time. So there's the, the new visitor center in the 1986 when it was put in. Um, we moved this maple tree from plugging up the entranceway. Uh, so there's all, you now see visually how to get into the woods, rebuilt the historic sign, and then made this entire place totally accessible to, uh, to wheelchairs. Your Woods gets about a million people a year uh, that visit. Um, it's a very narrow valley. It's highly impacted by people. So it's a, the balancing of public access and natural restoration is a, is a real trick, but this is a highly, uh, it's been a very successful experiment. The parking lot used to be here. It's now sort of an entry plaza. It's a place to interpret what's going on right along the edge of the creek. And you see, we're not in the redwood forest, we're in the riparian zone. So part of the, part of the education of coming to this place is that the redwoods don't exist in, alone. They are part of a larger system. So you learn about that first before you actually enter the, the cathedral. Once you're within, the trees themselves were being trampled, the, the roots were being uh, uh, compacted, um, uh, vegetation was gone. And so we raised it up, we raised it up, put a little raised boardwalk and there's no railing on this. There's just an edge that's established with a curb. So the, the boardwalk winds its way through in the most heavily populated areas, but you're in the forest, you're part of it, but you're not damaging the roots, the roots are, are revegetated. Uh, you are separated from the wild land, but you're a part of it. <clears throat> what we just think is a very important part of the access system here of trying to, of giving the experience of being in nature, but not damaging it. There are places of quiet, despite the crowds. Um, and then there are accessible gathering areas. Uh, this, this entire area is fully accessible to wheelchairs. Interpretive exhibits are displayed. This actually is a native clematis that's liming that, uh, that, that giant redwood tree. Places to sit and enjoy the forest. And, uh, and then on the, on the edge where the ranger station is and the concessionaire, we've built decks to handle the crowds. At the Centennial Opera uh, of, <coughs> excuse me, 2008, um, this is the environmental elite of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the conservation of all of the resources that we have is largely a result of these people here. Um, at that time, I did a calculation of the, the visitors for it, it, when it began uh, in counting in the 1970, had about 200,000 visitors. By this time, there were over 800,000, almost 900,000 visitors coming to the woods every year. In, 2000, in 1970, the woods, the ecology of the woods was in serious decline. By this time in 2008, the Northern Spotted Owl had returned. Uh, the, uh, it was just, it was rich with wildlife. It was rich with understory. So the combination of increased visitation and improved environmental uh, ecological health was demonstra is demonstrated in this place in a highly impacted way. So it's a, a real success story, but, but we're, we'll take a look now downstream. Uh, Muir Woods is up here. We're gonna look at Muir Beach. Again, this is uh, thinking in terms of the watershed. Um, the, uh, this is the place you can see Muir Beach here in the foreground, the community of Muir Beach is here. This is the Green Gulch Farm. That's the San Francisco Zen Center's property out, uh, out in Muir Gulch. And this is in the distance, there's uh, San Quentin Prison and Berkeley is way over there. And this is San Francisco, uh, the, the East Bay. So it's very close. It's right at the Bay Area. To do, this is a different project in the scale and, and the kind of in the complexity of the project. 
uh, but it's similar kind of work. In this case, the, that environment was so badly degraded that it, we needed to restore it in a, in a fundamental way. We were asked to restore it in a fundamental way. And in order to do the ecological restoration work, one way you start, you go back in history and try and figure out what was the hydrologic system intact at the time uh, when before Europeans arrived. And we happen to have access to a, an 1853 map that the US Coast and Geodetic Survey did. They did that all along the coast. In fact, John Muir was one of the surveyors on the inland portion. And they discovered Muir Beach had this, this wonderland of an, it's sort of an ecological wonderland. There's the beach itself in the front, dunes behind, and then this giant lagoon, about a 30 acre lagoon behind, freshwater lagoon. And then the river valleys going back up to Muir Woods and into Green Gulch were just dense with vegetation. That was what was discovered at, just at the, right after the, the, the gold rush. 40 years later, on the right-hand side, there's another USGS survey of Big Lagoon, and you can see that the lagoon itself is silted in. There is no lagoon in this map. Between 1850s and 1918, in the turn of the century, cattle were brought in, grazed without, without any, uh, any constraints. The uh, logging, a couple of the canyons were completely logged of redwoods. Roads were put in, and, and there was total devastation of the of the, the underlying structural system of the of the watershed, and siltation. It, all the the soil started running down, and it filled in big lagoon. So basically, in 50 years, we lost the lagoon to the destructive environmental practices. By the 1920s, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge was being constructed. Muir Beach itself was uh, seen as a real estate bonanza and there was being promoted heavily by the real estate agent entities. Um, uh, early on in the 30s or so, there was a, a tavern built in cabins uh, right on the beach. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the development built a bridge out from the, uh, out to the beach. This bridge essentially was destroyed about every two years. You couldn't sustain a bridge in that location uh, given the, the storms and, and the dynamics. But they were coming out there to mine the dunes. There was lots of road construction, concrete needed sand for construction. So this was sort of an industrial site as well. Dunes are mined. And by the 1960s, uh, uh, this was uh, the scene at Muir Beach was basically one of, of total environmental devastation. Um, uh, totally denuded area. The, the creek itself, this, the creek would have been down here in the valley, had been moved. George Wheelwright wanted to move it out, so he put it behind levees on high ground and he made a horse pasture, no vegetation. And, uh, and this is one of the things that prompted the, the strong environmental movement uh, in the Bay Area. By the 1970s, uh, the park was established, it became the Golden Gate National Recreation Area was established and it was left alone and it sort of began its own healing process. Uh, there is a, nature does tend to heal itself, but underlying that was a system that was in bad disrepair. And, uh, and as uh, 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 this is the Green Gulch Farm, uh, in the foreground, you can see the vegetation is coming back. This is an idyllic scene. And I would take graduate students out here a lot and people would think this was a, a just a beautiful, healthy nature when in fact it was very badly damaged underneath. And, which, and how do we understand, how do we know that? Our culture is not learning about what wild nature, healthy wild nature is. We learn about these sort of scenic landscapes and think they're good. But this is, we were hired then in 1994 uh, to, to restore Big Lagoon. This was the directive to the National Park Service and, it's, and, uh, and they actually uh, didn't have the money. They, they got um, uh, Caltrans to hire us to, uh, to restore Big Lagoon. So we went back to the historic map to see what it meant, what Big Lagoon meant. And I'll just diverge for a second here. When you analyze this, the upper map here, 
it gives you a clue as to how what the underlying system is. Uh, down below is the map that we were faced with. This is what big. This is what Muir Beach looked like in 1994. This is what it looked like in 1853. There was a, a system of, of freshwater impulses, sand plugging up at the dunes and then making a, a, fr a seasonal brackish lagoon behind, and then it would pulse out in the, the heavy winter storms that would flush it out and you'd get this dynamic system. By the 1990s, the, uh, the creek had been moved. There was uh, unbridled public access all over the place. Uh, the Green Gulch Farm had, this is all concrete channel down to, down to the creek. And it was, uh, it was in, in, in very bad shape. Our instruction was to restore Big Lagoon. So we have engineering work that we have to do. So here, the first thing to do is to figure out how are we gonna get the lagoon to be reestablished? And so this is um, uh, going back to uh, uh, thinking about what you, where it would be naturally. And uh, let me go back one second here and see, if you look at on this diagram, you can see the parking lot that we're faced with here in the 60s is exactly, it sits on top of the, the lagoon. In other words, this is all filled in. And so we're, we're, we're faced with massive change of, of the grade. So we were gonna be excavating out and digging a big hole to recreate the lagoon. Uh, this was unanimously endorsed by all the environmentalists, all the community, everybody loved this idea. And we were gonna be establishing, reestablishing big lagoon. Um, the Caltrans opted out of the deal at this point. They found a piece of property that they thought the National Park Service really would like to have a little further to the north at the edge of Tomales Bay, and they bought it and donated it to the National Park Service and the Giacomini Ranch. And in exchange, they were let off the hook for restoring Big Lagoon. So 10 years went by, there was nothing that happened. The full environmental report was done on this scheme to restore Big Lagoon. And in that time, the scientists at the park began studying. They asked a the question, if that's all that sediment was coming down last hundred years, what's to stop it? We'd done lots of work in the valley floor, but it's all coming down. And they determined that the sedimentation that was underway from a hundred years of degradation was still proceeding rampantly in the, in the hillsides and the canyons at Mount Tamalpais. And that we would see Big Lagoon last for maybe 25 to 50 years. It would be filled in with dirt just because of the, the past environmental assault. That changed our thinking fundamentally. It also reminded me of what uh, Marty Samuels and, uh, and Dave McCarran were talking about hubris uh, in, their, in their lecture. We, have, uh, we thought the assembled environmental elite of the Bay Area thought that we could actually create a thing, a, a permanent thing in nature uh, that was part of a natural system. When in fact, what we should have been doing and what we are doing now is reestablishing a system that will establish will create its own its own way of functioning. We're gonna we're gonna heal the system and let the system then repair itself, rather than trying to create a thing that is, is as much an icon as the as the the redwood trees were. A very important lesson that we learned, and the the lesson from a design standpoint, is that we are designing for a natural process. We're not designing for an object very different from sculpture and very different from architecture. So the scheme that, was, that we came up with subsequently was to basically restore the creek, put the creek back where it belongs, let it carry the sediment out and then wait for sea level rise to happen. And when sea level rise happens, this will probably flood again and we'll have, we'll have a new big lagoon in another hundred years. But in the meantime, we're gonna not try and create something. In this case, the, the parking lot was going to stay where, where it was. So here's a photo of, of, that, of that first phase of work that was done. We, we moved the creek 
out into the valley where it belongs to the low ground, uh, backwater channels for frogs and turtles, salmon rearing, and shave the parking lot back a little bit to let this to let this happen. But leave this there and let it and let it uh, um, establish itself. The creek itself, within three months, this is the this is the engineered channel that we put in. There's this trapezoidal channel here. Within three months, this is the sediment load that came down from the from the mountain. It was just full of sediment, and we put in all these logs uh, uh, that were taken out from up above, dug them in, jammed in some willow trees, uh, and replanted this. So this is now becoming prime salmon habitat, and it's done it all by itself in three months in three month period of time. After uh, after the first season, this is generally what it looked like with the parking lot shaved back slightly and the wetlands being reestablished. The next stage was to, was to get the parking lot out of the floodplain. And so this, the parking lot used to be here in this area. We rotated that out and put it against the developed area on the, on the, the hillside and then constructed a, about a 450 foot long bridge across the floodplain over to the coastal trail. And then organized the human activities around, around this. 2015, so three years later, this is what it looks like uh, from up above. The, you come in and the parking lot is tucked against the hillside. Uh, wetlands are preserved and expanded. The creek is functioning beautifully. The lagoons are, are fine. The, the tidal lagoons and brackish lagoons are fine. And we have this new bridge across to the coastal trail and down. And then you cross this wetland, that's a restored uh, floodplain. The, the, the trick, we've got the, the engineering figured out, we've got the ecology figured out, the public access component is integral to this, been thinking all along about how this works together. You drive in and you see, you see the beach, you're aware that you're at the beach, but you find your place to park. You organize your activities right here, with the bathroom and picnic tables, and then you walk to the beach across the floodplain, across the creek, onto the hillside, through the dunes, and then to the beach. The experience of going to the beach is one of a more complete landscape experience. It's not just the one-off of going to the beach itself. Some images of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the new bridge. These are 90-foot spans to let the, the floodplain function uh, without obstruction in a new picnic area. There's the similar view from before, but the parking lot has moved out and this is all floodplain restoration. And here's the whole, the new bridge. Um, this is the way it looks in 2018. It's, it's, uh, it basically is one very large restored wetland and with people organized in, in a very discreet way. Uh, amenities, their bathrooms provided, lots of parking, interpretive facilities, outdoor picnic environmental education program. What people experience now, what you didn't experience before, you might not know it, but you experience wild nature returning in a healthy way. And this is what you'll take with you when you think about going to the beach, not just scenic nature, but this is actually well, healthy functioning nature. The experience of being on the bridge is fantastic. There's, there's, it's just, you go through this wonderland before you get to the beach. There's the bridge. This is all now, it's basically covered with will willow trees, but the tidal lagoon in the front, this has, this changes uh, uh, daily. Trail to the beach uh, along the, the coastal scrub at the, the hillside and down to the beach. It turns out that the National Park Service was, was, uh, was uh, sued for accessibility and they were having to make retrofit almost all of their, their facilities to be accessible. This is when the when Muir Beach was open, the first person to come to the beach was this man. He had sued the park successfully, was causing, was uh, making all kinds of renovations, and it's totally accessible to him. From uh, uh, it was it's just a it's, it's a it was a, uh, it was a terrific a terrific thing. We've restored the system. Uh, 
The idea was that we we're going to get salmon to restore, come back here. This was this, the southernmost wild coho salmon stream in the world. Uh, at uh, uh, the last count that I got from the Park Service Rangers last month was 16 coho salmon have made it upstream of which, and there were seven or eight carcasses. There used to be tens of thousands of these fish. That to restore, this is, there's been so much destruction in this watershed that we may never get the coho salmon to come back, but they're trying. And um, taking the little guys that were grown, uh, spawned at Muir Woods and upstream, took them and raised them in a hatchery and then brought them back uh, after three years and had them move upstream and spawn again. And then, and they've been trying this. Uh, this has been relatively successful, except the drought has, has uh, been devastating for us. But this is an ongoing program to reestablish the salmon runs in this particular place. So I want to stop in this by saying a couple things about where we have come in this conservation, in this work of conservation. We're dealing all the time with balancing built environment and natural environments having the natural environment function as a healthy, healthy functioning place and giving people the experience of understanding what it is and, and the experience of just being in nature. Those are individual place specific issues. There's a project in one place where you can deal with that. We are increasingly dealing with projects within entire watersheds, which means they're all interconnected as in this case, Muir Woods and Muir Beach. But it turns out that's only part of the issue. The, the eagles that, that are born and migrate from Alaska down to Mexico come here, they spend a lot of time in this particular area. This is migratory raptor habitat. And so there's a whole different layer of system. There are uh, uh, ladybugs that grow here and migrate to the Sierras and to Utah and back. That uh, there are uh, 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 monarch butterflies that use this area as well. In other words, we are part of a larger systems and our ability to function as a, it, within a world of, of extreme environmental degradation means that we need to understand how we are part of those larger systems. And this is part of the work that, with, that the conservation organizations are doing today. They're expanding their thinking to landscape scale spaces and thinking in terms of overall global systems. And so I just wanted to leave you with, with, that, with that thought that's implicit in that is a paradigm shift in the way in which we deal with our, our natural and built environments, how we interact between the two and how well, we understand and incorporate wildlands into our daily lives. So with that, I'm just gonna end with a, a photo of me and my grandkids at Muir Beach. The salmon have just started to run and, uh, uh, and it's a place for people and wildlife to coexist in harmony. So I think I'll, I'll end my show with that. Thank you, John. I think we may have lost Huff. He may have had some technical difficulties. Yep. Are you here, John Huffnagel, or not? Okay. Doesn't look um, like. What we're going to do is um, we're going to break out into breakout rooms, about six of you in each room. I had 28 that started, and now I have 32. So some people may be left in the main room with me. And I think we have one member of the planning group in each room, except the last one. And Tom Phillips, you're in the last group. So I'll ask you to be the moderator of that group. And John Roberts, you're in the first room. So if you'll do that. And then, I'm back. 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 Yeah, you're, you're uh, back, John. There you are. Huff. You may be with me in the main room. We'll see if we can get you in a room. So a, a topic to discuss in the breakout rooms, John. Uh, well, I'm particularly interested in, in how people, you guys specifically, but, but anybody else as well, have interacted with wild nature and it is a part of your daily life. Um, how do we understand that? I know we're very involved with scenic nature 
and uh, and we have a lot to do with um, all kinds of organizations and and parks and places that we go to, but to actually reconnect somehow with wildlands and uh, is a is a fundamentally different set of issues. And I'm just curious how many of you have have had experiences where you you make that a part of your daily life and how does it influence you? So that, that's okay, my okay. particular interest. Um, Break us out, Larry. We're going to have 15 minutes in breakout rooms, and I'll give you a three-minute warning and then 15 seconds. So let's let's see if this works. Here we go. Well, there's the three of us. Okay. Hey, Wally. Wally. Un on unmute you. yourself. Unmute yourself. You're muted, Wally. Are you, you're still mute? Are you on an iPad or on a computer? If you're on an iPad, you got to look at three little dots somewhere. There okay. you go. Hey, Wally, how are you? I'm, I'm very sorry. It's a gorgeous day here in Oregon, and I was out. In my garden, I thought that was pretty appropriate. <laughs> well, this this works out well, Wally, because uh, I don't know how to quite do it. I suppose I could put you in rooms, but since there's the three of us and we're recording, um, we can chat about this. Sorry, anyway. I just, and all of a sudden, I went I went dead. And I tried to rework it with two different computers. I finally got us back again. Yeah, I don't know what the heck happened? But uh, I'm I'm back, so. Uh, that's great. John did a beautiful job. I could hear him on my on my uh, uh, telephone. I could assign you to breakout rooms. I found out how, but I think we just sit here and chat. No, uh, let's sit yeah. and chat. Yeah. yeah. Um, how you doing, Wally? I'm doing really well. In fact, I'm in a crazy mode right now. I've been walking between ten and fifteen miles a day to get rid of the get ready ready for the Camino in northern Spain, which I'm heading to in exactly wow. a month. Talking about, talking about outdoor environments and wonderful. Right. Wow. Yeah. What made you decide to do that, Wally? What, what was the inspiration? Well, you know, I, I've actually, since I graduated, I've been a Spanish teacher. So I'm fluent in the language and I've known about it for years. I was, uh, I was all scheduled to do it two years ago, but American Airlines had other ideas and canceled my ticket. So. <laughs> It's funny yeah, you should so mention, I am. It's funny you should uh, mention that in John Roberts. My my wife and I two years ago had our 50th wedding anniversary, and we had scheduled to go to Machu Picchu. Ah. And before they they're threatening to close it down because of all the traffic and trails. Right. Um, and so we got canceled for a year, and now we're scheduled to go in September or October while I can still walk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you, Larry, you've had experience, obviously, with a lot of um, environmental things and easements and, and that. I, I have had quite a bit as well um, in terms of being involved in the land trust and on a board for eight years and one of the senior board members of it. And um, <laughs> having had the legal background, it was really, it was fun because I was head of the land committee for, for a period of about six years. And the question that I have, and I'm going to ask John, we did a whole lot of studying on um, what's better to let a piece of property just be totally wild or to manage it for the wildlife and, and for everything. And we've had that conversation quite a bit. And it's left some wild, but most of it's managed um, because the threat of fire. Um, the fact that the animals can actually get around more it may not have as much in the way of, of uh, wildlife, but it, it, it seemed to be <coughs> from the standpoint of protecting the area to clean it up a little bit is, has worked out exceedingly well from having the, uh, uh, the wildlife may not all the, all the uh, have all of the um, bacteria that you would have if you just let it go completely. Um, 
and the, some of the bugs, but it really has, has made for a, a, a much safer environment. Um, if this is a, we have unique, unique, obviously here in the West and especially in Colorado, Denver, outside of Denver, um, literally 15 miles to the north of Denver was the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, which was plutonium for nuclear right. weapons. And then it went through a period of being managed up until the last group was Dow Chemical. Suits, countersuits. Well, that arsenal uh, has been brought back to a wildlife refuge. And is one of the most, it's got buffalo without fences on the outside. Uh, elk, deer, um, and to go through, if you ever want to look it up, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, the project was absolutely unbelievable in terms of what they had to do to reclaim the land and then uh, uh, enable people to go out and live in it and see nature. So that's a, that's a big project here, but you'd had to manage it. You just couldn't let it go. Right wild again but it's gradually just like john roberts has done with some management and trying to get it back to its natural state absolutely fantastic absolutely fantastic well that's that's great yeah and, and then, Holly, you're you're out in oregon and, and uh, obviously they've done an awful lot in the state of oregon in that area yeah I, you know i i I'm sad to say that i consider myself an environmentalist but I don't really do that much other than give money. So well, that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good thing. But do you get, it? Do you you get know, out? I had to laugh. The last time I saw John Roberts was probably, I don't know, soon after we graduated, we walked in the Williams Experimental Forest together with, Paul, Lip, with Paul Lipoff. Paul's on today. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, do you get to Mount Hood and in, in, in around that area at all? Oh, yeah, that's very easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful place. And that's been pretty well preserved. Yes. And actually, there's a place I like even better, better. that's a little further south in the Cascades called Olali Lake. Yeah. And it's actually yeah. on Native American land. But as long as you don't mess with it. They're fine with you going up to the uh, to the top of Olali Butte, which is a gorgeous climb, and it's on an unmarked trail. But they don't mind you using it as long as you know you Thank care you. for it. Yeah. But, but there's no signs. You have to know where it is. Well, I was in the in the service up at uh, Fort Lewis in Tacoma, and yeah. the Olympic Peninsula, Mount Rainier. Uh, it, you just it's hard to explain the beauty of Washington State and Oregon to people that have not spent time. Right. It, it's unbelievable. Well, I ended up in Oregon by accident because my wife and I had taken a trip all around the United States in 74, 75. And then she decided she wanted to go to law school, but not until February. And all the good law schools had already, well, I won't say good law schools. All the prestigious law schools, which she could have gotten into, were already closed, but she didn't want to wait. So she ended up coming yeah, out here to Portland to go to Lewis and Clark. Beautiful place. <laughs> and, and it ended up making all the difference. She ended up being a professor there. Well, it's an awfully good school, Wally. Yeah, yeah well, you know, it was barely accredited when she started there. Uh, we have a lot of kids from Denver that don't want to go back east that love the West. A lot going to Lewis and Clark. Yeah. From, this, from the high and, school. And one of her classmates and good friends was Heidi Heitkamp, the former senator from North Dakota. You have children, Wally? I do. I've got a daughter who's uh, about to turn 40 and a son who's 35. And are they in that area or are they all over the my world? My son is. My daughter's in the Bay Area, which is a nice place to be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That so would nice you place. consider, would you, they consider them conservationists and environmentalists? Are they sensitive yep. to the, what's going on? Absolutely. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, I've got. I've, I've got five of them, and and uh, one of them runs the oldest conservation uh, organization in the state of Maine. The, the uh, uh, one of the land trusts has been doing that for 12, 14 years at this point. And which so, which one is it, John? Uh, it used to be the Damascotta River Association, and uh, now it's the Coastal Rivers uh, Conservation Trust because they took over three or four other uh, land trusts. And yeah. it, it, Where, where's the headquarters? In Damascotta, oh, where okay. he lived. So they're close by us. And then another one, another son of mine, is, he did the Appalachian Trail um, hike the outback in Australia and, and the two islands, New Zealand. And he's, wow. a, he's a, real, a real hiker. And our girls have, have all been through we're bound programs and, and love the outdoor. So uh, it's part of our family. We have a uh, place on an island off the coast that has not been developed. Um, and it's so oh, nice. Yeah, it really is. It's a lot of fun. Very, very you've got three minutes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just, I gave, I gave a three minute three, warning. <laughs> I gave a three minute warning to everybody. And uh, I think that, I think I've got it automatic where they come back on. I think that's what happens. Yeah. After they get the 15 second warning. Yeah, I gave him, I think I gave him 15 seconds. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, interestingly, Wally, John knows a little bit about this. I married a woman that, that uh, had historic roots here in the, through her family in outskirts of Denver and had, it was a big ranch owned by the first and second ter territorial governors. And she's a long descendant of that. So I've been involved with private land on giving a conservation easement. We did it through the, then the American Farmland Trust. Um, but then three years ago, because it's it's so hard to take care of private land that's large weeds, reseeding, uh, wetlands, that I've been working with the uh, conservation of the uh, Natural Conservation District of the USDA and talk about bureaucrats and, <laughs> and working to show right, it is Larry. unbelievable. Yeah. I, it, it 18-page thing, you know, if you don't do this, you don't do that. But it's so expensive to do weed control when you have large land. And out here, you have the good neighbor policy. So if you have very wealthy people that own land next to you and the weeds go on theirs, they have the right to hire people to come in and spray for weeds and charge you for it oh, or, oh, yeah. <laughs> talk about a good neighbor policy. yeah oh man yeah uh, well, that's sure. something well, that is that's what john I mean, the basic thing is what john's been doing all these years it, it just takes such patience i mean it's a his projects some of them have been 15 20 years and, and, and they're doing I'm going to close the rooms and bring everybody back. So, Huff, okay. you're good as long as I'll I watch for good. questions. As long as I'm on, I'm good. Then yeah. if not, take over. And and, <laughs> and 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 you'll announce the next next yes. uh, meeting next is two. okay. Here we go. <laughs> Fifteen seconds, and they'll be back. Great, it's great to see you, Wally. You yeah, well, sure is, Wally. It well. it's really a lot of fun. John, I'll have to get together with you in Maine sometime. I spend my summers there. Well, you certainly do. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I've been a counselor at a camp in Bridgeton, which is sort of over near Fiber, Fiber right. and I Know it well. Yeah. Know it well. So, John, right. John Wally back. Wilson. I, I finally returned. I had a little bit of a computer glitch, but I, I finally returned. And, and really, uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the uh, breakout rooms. John, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Robert, that was just really a, a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for putting it all together. I just, this, what a lot of what a lot of work, and as I said earlier, what a lot of patience in terms of dealing with all the different organizations that, to make it uh, come together. Yeah, it's just really exciting stuff. And I'm just going to open it up at this point to questions. Um, and I don't know whether anybody has any, but I had one because we were talking about, it, and I'll start with that. Um, that I'm, I've been involved with the land trust for, for uh, quite some time. And, and, uh, and I know my son is, is the head of one of the oldest land trusts in Maine as well. So it's been kind of fun to be together and, and work on some of these projects. But the question of managed forest versus 
totally letting it go. Um, we have really had some issues of that in both of our land trusts as to how do we manage, the, should we manage the land or not manage the land and just let it go. And so we've ended up in both land trusts have some land that we haven't touched at all, but uh, a major portion of it is managed. And, and we have found that that management aspect has really helped uh, in terms of wildlife within the area and uh, has certainly pushed uh, kept the issue of fire down and other damage to it. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit about what your thoughts are on that issue. I think management is a key is a key thing. You it, it's hard to to um, if you don't manage the land, then uh, it will turn in ways that that uh, uh, become terrible fire hazards. Uh, you'll get all kinds of noxious uh, exotic yes. vegetation coming in, and uh, uh, and uh, wildlife will will diminish. The, uh, it turns out that the, a lot of the, the areas that are the richest from wildlife standpoint are those at the edges of places where they, they can get cover and then come out in places that are open. So the management is, 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 a key, is a key thing. Uh, and, uh, and I think we, and even with the kind of wildfire risks we have these days uh, here in California, that that's, the management requirements are far greater than they than they seem to have been in the past, and uh, yeah, it's an unmanaged landscape. The native people in California were were intense land managers, and uh, they talk about good fire, for instance, and they talk and uh, uh, um, so it, it's a it, it's something that you simply need to do as a conservation manager that you need to be on top of that, and it's costly. But it's, it's good volunteer work, though. It certainly is. Thank you. Other question? Alan Stern, uh, I think, has one. Alan, you've got your hand up. Put your this hand up if you can. This is wonderful. Uh, could you explain the difference between a national monument, a national park, and a national forest? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the difference between national parks and national forests are that forests are run by the, uh, in the Department of Agriculture. And they're a resource, they're, they're funded, founded as sort of a resource extraction agency to harvest forests or to the like. There was a, it was a, a way of, of managing resources for extraction. Uh, national parks are set up to conserve them, to conserve the land. So there's a fundamental difference between the, the two, national parks and national forests. National monuments are typically uh, very specific localized Places, the Alamo, or or a, you know a, a, a historic person's house, or in this case it would stretch to be Muir Woods uh, uh, because because they could do it, but they're much more limited in their uh, in their scope and and scale, and they're usually specific to a, a particular cultural or natural resource. Any Great. other? Thank you, you. you can use that reaction button if you're on a computer down at the bottom, and it'll raise hand if you see it. If you can't see it and wave your hand, John and I might be able to see it a call on you. Ron. Ron, unmute, we see you. Yeah, what course did John take at Williams that got him miseducated? <laughs> <laughs> I took the first ecology course, but what? what's your education that got you to this point? Uh, well, I, I, I was an economics major and I flunked my first economics class. <laughs> I hated that. I hated it. I, I, I retook it at Stanford over the summer and I did fine and I did so well. I thought maybe I'd do this as a, as a, as a degree, but I, I hated it. So, um, uh, so I did, I, I had a couple of very good English teachers at, at Williams, uh, who really encouraged me to learn how to read and to write uh, uh, critically. And then, uh, and then I discovered uh, the world of, of the creative arts that, that I pursued myself separately. And so, and so 
uh, Williams gave me a, a, a wonderful liberal arts education and the and the work that I do in landscape architecture is is very multidisciplinary. It's there, when I started this work, there was no one, there was no profession that was trained to think comprehensively about the outdoor environment. There were engineers and there were architects and, and biologists, but there weren't, nobody was being trained to bring it all together and make a place. And so the liberal arts education, I think helped me in doing that. I was, I got into a graduate program at Cal that was specifically for people like me that had no background in design or architecture or engineering. They wanted liberal arts educated people uh, who had created a bent. And so, and that's been the most successful professional program at, at Cal and all, many other universities have it as well. Um, uh, so that, that's if, through UC Berkeley, I got the technical education and there was lots of just sort of personal, I spent a lot of time outdoors, uh, on in wilderness areas and the, in the Midwest up in uh, the Quetico Superior National Park in Canada um, and uh, on various places. It was, uh, and I did a lot of construction as well. So, so the combination of living outdoors, gardening and the like. So I think, I think it, it all came together through, through UC Berkeley. And then I had some really good mentors in the profession. So I think that's probably, probably, where the education came from. Ron Bodenson, before you came on, John and I were on early getting some logistics ready. And <coughs> when you think about it, a professional dancer, a stevedore, a, a international banker, and a conservationist and architect, <laughs> he must be a Renaissance man and got it from somewhere, not just from Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'd like to ask uh, Rick Ackerley, because you recently moved very close to Muir Woods, if I'm not mistaken. Do you have any perspective on this, Rick? Oh, you got to unmute yourself. I, I'm Rick, mute. Rick, mute. Um, but not really, except, I mean, I haven't been to, uh, to Muir Woods or Muir Beach in, in a long time. I, I went up, uh, I climbed uh, Mount Tam, uh, about a month ago, and it was glorious looking down on everything that you just talked about. But um, yeah, I mean, it, I, I, yeah, I guess, wait, um, several months ago, I walked through Muir Woods and, you know, it's just gorgeous, but I don't really, I mean, I, I had no idea what you were doing behind the scenes. So. Not a lot of fun, the finding out these things about each other. One of the great things. And Don, one of the things you've been teaching for a long time, <clears throat> you had some of your your uh, students go on to do things that you've been excited about seeing. Uh, yeah. Have any comments on that? Yeah, that's been a great source of uh, the, the, a lot of former students have come to work for me. Uh, I have a small office. It doesn't it don't it, it's a you know, five, five people, maybe six at the most at sometimes. Uh, but most of them are former graduate students of mine. Uh, one fellow was with me, he worked on both of these projects, he just moved recently to Portland, Maine. He's, he, he, discovered a, he discovered a love of, of theater. He went from engineering to landscape architecture to theater. So he's, he's now pursuing his theatrical aspirations in Portland, Maine, of all places. <laughs> So, and uh, another, uh, another young gal uh, works for me now from Chile, um, from Santiago and, and uh, uh, is very connected with the, the, the all of the, the new conservation work that's going on down in Patagonia and all through, all through Chile. It just sounds really interesting to me. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been a, the teaching has given me contact with, with young people and, uh, a whole world that they bring, and uh, uh, it's been it's it's been a real source of source of um, inspiration for me, as well as stimulation. That's Ken great. Wilcox had his Ken hand raised, yeah. Jim Allen. Ken, you have to unmute. Yeah, I'm I'm muted. Okay, uh, say so John, I uh, for the last ten years as uh, mayor of our town, I was trying to 
restore the lakeshore uh, on the big lake that we're uh, adjacent to. And uh, it took all 10 years, it's actually coming together. But the uh, design outfit that we worked with was an outfit out of Denver called Civitas. And I wondered if you were familiar with them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're great. Yeah, they're great. They do uh, good urban design. And it, it's a, yeah, you got a good, you probably got a good product out of them. They, they yeah, they did a great, great job. Uh, I, I visited Ken um, twice. Uh, the first time I, I saw him, bef the, uh, did the before, and then I saw the after. It was quite glorious. Yes. Jim Allen. Yeah. Jim Allen. <laughs> so, John, um, you don't sound like you're on the retirement mode too much. You're working pretty hard. <laughs> For how long were you dancing, and how much of that is still a part of your life now? Uh, well, very little of it's part of my life. It's, uh, you know, two hip replacements, and we get a little crotchety over time. Um, the, uh, uh, I did it seriously for, I, I would say, eight years, uh, uh, a, a couple of years in New York, uh, and then I had to come back and deal with the draft. And, uh, and then when I went back to Cal at, in graduate school, it turns out that People that I knew at the Martha Graham School had moved and were, were, were had founded a dance department at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So I joined them, and I was so I, while I was in graduate school, I was also dancing full time. And uh, and then we had a little company. We went on tour a bit around this area. And then my wife uh, had a theater company. She and her partner uh, had a children's theater company that that thrived for 17 years or so, and we. We did work, we did uh, pieces together and I participated with them. So it probably lasted seriously for me for eight years, but I was connected for another another 10. And then she's she retired from that and uh, uh, is, is doing other things. Uh, but uh, we, we, go, we actually don't do, we go to theater a lot, but we don't see many dance concerts. It's interesting. Thank so. you. And All the topics. Yeah, I'll turn to you, Paul, for the last question, and then we've got to, to uh, wrap it up. What a, what a great time this has been, John. Hey, John, terrific presentation, terrific work you've done. I just want to check. I know my short-term memory is shot, but my, maybe my long-term memory is okay. It <laughs> seems to me that back at Williams, <clears throat> you saw the movie. We all saw the movie, Zorba the Greek. Yeah. And, and that's what launched your <laughs> dancing. There you go, that's right. <laughs> you hired, you went to Albany to a dance teacher and you went from Greek dancing to Russian dancing. There you go. And that's how that's it right. all got started. That's right. Yvonne Kirov was my teacher. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, and by that's, the that's, way, you were always a Renaissance man. You decided you wanted to build and carve your own Revolutionary War era musket. During That's right. Times. I made a Kentucky rifle while, I, while I, in my my little dorm room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all okay. right. Thank you. Yeah, thank I remember you all. Those. I just wanted to wanted to close and thank you, John, for this. It was really just a terrific presentation. I just wanted to close here, here. With just uh, to say that we have two more Zoom sessions coming up before we have reunion, which is coming on <laughs> on ninth to the twelfth of June. Um, and I think you all received notices from the college this week uh, for signing up for reunion. And I know I've, I've got talked to, uh, back and forth with a few of you, you've already signed up. So let's get on that. We'd love to have as many people back because we're gonna do some sessions uh, at uh, during reunion, which I think when we're all together is gonna be even more uh, fun to, to be able to share the experiences after our discussion. I wanted to let you know that, that on Thursday, April 21st, we have before Woodward and Bernstein, we had uh, Matthews, Eric, and, and Schooley and for an evening with the Williams record. And uh, I've been part of listening to all of this and it really is, we've got some great things to say. It's gonna be a fun and, and enjoyable evening. And then on May 19th, <coughs> We have the honor of having um, uh, Tom Parker, who has been the director of admissions at Williams and then at Amherst. And he's gonna be talking about the current state of admissions 
the little three, which I think is going to be a really interesting presentation too. So go to your uh, your email and get started, and we hope you'll all come back to reunion. It just will be a, be a great time. And um, as I say, we have these two sessions coming for that, but let's uh, sign up if you can. And if you can't, let us know. And, and uh, we just would love to have as many back as, as we possibly can. Uh, so come along. Thank you and, for thank organizing you. this. Thank, thank you, you all. All right. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks thank thanks thank so you, John much, John. And John. Thank you.